everybody and a very warm welcome to the big issue debate today we are talking about the assets of the future my name is julia streets i'm the moderator for the session and i have a an amazing panel lined up for you i am so looking forward to this discussion allow me to introduce them to you so i'm joined by mike demacy who is the head of digital assets and advanced solutions at uh, BNY Mellon. Now, just to give you a sense, uh, the Digital Assets Unit was formed to accelerate the development of solutions and capabilities to help clients address growing and evolving needs related to the growth of digital assets. So Mike, it's wonderful you could be with us today. Joining Mike is Mark Smith. He is the CEO and co-founder of Symbiont. And Mark brings two decades of global experience in FinTech. He's created and deployed disruptive technologies to the foreign exchange ecosystem for both institutional and non-institutional clients. So Mark, great to see you. Can't wait for your thoughts. Also joining us is Jennifer Peavy. Now, Jennifer is responsible for the DTCC's uh, global corporate strategy because she is head of strategy and business development at the DTCC. Think digital product development, think strategic partnership, think alliances. That is what Jennifer focuses on every single day. So Jennifer, great to see you. Thanks for being with us. And last but not least is Philippe Benoit, who is head of strategic business development and transformation, and he's head of Asia Pacific at BNP Paribas. So he is thinking about the bank's four key business lines and also corporate development strategy, public affairs, finance, assets, liability, management, and treasury as well. So we have a really wonderful panel. We're going to look at the conversation about the future of assets through many, many different lenses. And I wonder if we could get straight into this because there's a lot of discussion about NFTs and tokenization, and this is very much a topic of the day. And I wondered, Jennifer, if I could ask you just to kind of level set a little bit and come to you, first of all, just to think about what has particularly changed of note. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Julia. So um, I thought I'd start with in 2018, we actually conducted a strategy offsite and explored various scenarios that we thought could shape the future of our markets in five to 10 years. And, you know, when we came away from that, we had agreed on four guidance principles that would stand the test of time. I think these are important to the overall discussion, but the first one is companies will always need to raise capital. Uh, the second, investors will continue to invest and seek returns by trading on market prices. The third was there will continue to be demand for investment advice. And the fourth, a regulatory framework will evolve but continue to govern the exchange of assets. We also agreed that that meant everything in between was essentially up for grabs and subject to change. And it should. Why? Well, global events, market events, technology advancements, they all continue to quicken the pace of change in financial services. And as it does, client expectations and their priorities change. Regulatory um, expectations continue to evolve. Um, we, what we've seen is that clients are really interested in products and services that are more accessible, affordable, and available. The very definition of what's disruptive, right? And basically in anything that will help them do their jobs or make their lives better, faster, cheaper. Their focus, um, especially in our industry, does tend to be on how do they reduce risk and costs, um, how do they enhance efficiencies and comply with all of the changing regulatory requirements through digital transformation. And I think companies likewise are also looking for innovative solutions to overcome today's challenges and seize those new opportunities for growth, right? No one wants to be left behind. So how do they realize their goals, right? Well, you know, a lot of us are looking to leverage new and novel technologies to enable a more digital world in which our industry can operate. Um, FinTech, CBDC, currencies, stable coins, NFTs, and the digitalization of financial assets are all offering us opportunities to change the way we do what we do today and do it better, faster, and cheaper. So we've come a long way, broadly speaking. There's no shortage of FMIs or financial institutions that are exploring the use of new, newer and novel tech or innovations. There's no shortage of visionaries who are challenging how we do things today in search of a more 
effective model. And across the globe, we have central banks experimenting and researching the feasibility of central bank digital currency. We have trailblazers across the globe that are moving towards the adoption of DLT and digital assets for securities. And we have a breadth of assets emerging that seek to solve similar pain points around provenance. So not all of it will make sense to everyone. It doesn't have to, but it really shouldn't be ignored. We've got a great opportunity right now to reimagine how our industry should operate in a more digital world. It's not going to happen overnight, but you know we're moving the needle. So. Absolutely. Well, thank you for the, for the scene setter on that, because I, I'd like to, when you talk about sort of disruptive, and I mentioned in the opening remarks, Mark, about your, you know, your, your history in the world of fintech as well. And kind of when we think about evolving assets and assets of the future, we quite naturally seem to gravitate towards the conversation about crypto, or we gravitate towards the conversation about NFTs. And I'd love to get your, your thoughts. I mean, are we becoming too narrow in our focus? What, what are your considerations when you talk about evolving assets? Certainly, don't think we're getting narrow. I think I think it is widening every day. Uh, there there are new advancements happening all over the world. What's really exciting about this is this is a global movement. This might be the first time in history where we've had the opportunity to think about things in a global context and the creation of new assets, new technologies to drive those assets forwards, um, new strategies to use those assets, um, but also ways to take traditional assets and reimagine them so that they become safer. They become more valuable and they really become a more um, uh, entrenched part of the overall global marketplace, not just in the United States, but everywhere. So when you think about things like cryptocurrencies and, and, and NFTs and what's happening there in that space, that's really about economy building. Right? When, when you think about what, what's, what's the real goal when you build a new network, you launch a new token, um, the goal is to increase the value of that token. It's a singular effort and everything that happens around that is designed to in, increase the price of that particular asset. And what we've seen is, is that the first use case that's successful in cryptocurrencies has been speculative trading. And speculative trading has been able to fuel the investment, fuel the flow of dollars into those spaces or, or, or different types of currency. I shouldn't say dollars anymore. Uh, all different types of currency to flow into those spaces and drive that innovation. Um, and then you start to see uh, maturity take place. And Bitcoin is the first of these to mature into something other than just a speculative tradable asset. It's now become a reserve asset. It's something that people are putting on their balance sheets. They see it as a long-term piece of a financial strategy. Um, and then we have new things like NFTs and products like yield farming, which are part of what's going on with cryptocurrencies. And you have <clears throat> DeFi, which is really just a new lexicon for talking about uh, consumer repo and the way that works. And so we've got all these new things happening in, in that space. And that space has inspired what's going on in the more traditional financial marketplace, where the technology has really taken hold. And we're starting to see uses of the technology so that we can reimagine some existing instruments like RMBS and CMBS. That was the poster child for a financial engineering disaster in the previous financial crisis. Um, uh, and, and we think about that was a huge part of the liquidity story uh, across all markets. And then that was basically taken to zero post the crisis. And now with this new technology, you can use smart contracts and distributed ledger blockchain technology to create these things in a way in which you can get real-time information about the underlying assets in those particular type of pools and securities and bring them back in a way that is safe and secure. So it's a very exciting time to, to be in financial markets. Um, it certainly is, is much more exciting than the last time we had this kind of boom in, in the dot-com world. And if we can't exceed what happened there in, in this universe, I think we've got a lot of really interesting things to come over the next couple of decades. Absolutely, completely agree. And, and and Mike, I'm really keen to hear your thoughts on this, really, because when I mentioned sure. in the opening remarks about your head of digital assets and advanced solutions, and what what's, what's your point of view when you think about you know the the evolution of uh, assets? Thanks, Julie. So yes, I think uh, you know at BNY Mellon we see the future of assets being digital, right? Like I'm mean, so building on uh, you know what Mark is talking about. So we take a more expansive view of digital assets, you know, that goes beyond the headline grabbing, you know, crypto and NFT. Uh, those are important. They are uh, paving the way, uh, but it, it includes, you know, various forms of digital cash as well as tokenized assets. And so, you know, that view is informed by, you know, our appreciation for the powerful underlying innovations, you know, that makes them possible. 
uh, and you know we see at least you know two powerful forces in play. Uh, one is you know blockchain has made digital currency possible by uh, you know systematically. I'm oversimplifying it, but systematically solving so one cannot double spend, right? Like and and allowing a transfer of value between two parties in a secure way, and that we believe is you know very significant transformative power, and it's it's a big deal. Uh, and secondly, you know, asset tokenization um, opens up possibilities with far-reaching implications. So you can codify ownerships uh, of you know various assets and put them on these digital rails, and this can impact liquidity. It, it can impact transaction efficiency, access, and much more. And and at the same time, when you look at the decentralized construct of these technologies themselves, uh, it enables actually new business models. And we already are seeing it. Mark talked about DeFi and the DeFi space where you've got people uh, around the world collaborating on a project and be rewarded in tokens and you know, benefit on the upside of their projects. This is, you know, this is new and it's going to actually accelerate innovation. And so all these are powerful forces that are transformative. And as a firm, you know, we're uh, thinking forward and we're preparing ourselves to support our clients on this journey as assets evolve. You know, it's wonderful listening to the three of you talk because Jennifer was starting with the fundamental premise of what you were trying to achieve around capital raising and thinking about regulation. And then Mark was talking about, you know, kind of creating value and, and aggregate and appreciating value, if you like. And then you're talking there about sort of unlocking new business models as well. So Philippe, I can't wait to hear your thoughts, actually, <laughs> just to complete the picture of what, we, what we're talking about in the context of this conversation, really pushing our thinking. Uh, thank you, Julia. First of all, I think uh, clearly the crisis has even accelerated the topic. Uh, and it's very interesting to see how it fosters transformation and innovation. And I think it was illustrated by my colleagues. I think to tap another angle, what I like about this, it's, uh, it's transforming the way we work in many ways. And notably because the ecosystem, to make it work, embark a lot of stakeholders. So it's a new ecosystem embarking, of course, clients for us, but fintech, uh, regulators, and infrastructure. And I think this panel is a good illustration of this challenge. So it's new ways of working to deliver tangible results. I would say on the parallel note, let's not be naive. We need a bit of playbook and taxonomy coming from regulators. And we have seen all the debate recently around the crypto. I mean, recent decision in Asia, in China in particular, from last weekend to ban crypto in the country. We have seen all the debate on the Libra a few months back. So I think definitely we will foster innovation and transformation, but we need a bit more uh, effort from regulators to uh, frame things together, notably for the banking industry. From a BNP Paribas standpoint, I think definitely we are embarked in this journey. Digital asset, DLT, CBDC, we are all working uh, towards uh, those uh, aspects, putting teams together and, uh, and uh, helping to, uh, let's say, uh, create design proper uh, proof of concept and move uh, ideally to live uh, initiative. I think uh, this is part of the exciting journey ahead of us on this topic. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, kind of having the conversation about the regulatory frameworks that, that are required, but also the reality of, of transformation as well from an organizational standpoint is just kind of rounds that out really beautifully. But what I'd love to do now is I just want to push the conversation kind of almost up a level and for the benefit of the audience to really understand why this conversation even matters. So when we think about, you know, kind of why asset developments truly matter and think about the real world challenges that asset developments are truly solving, I would love each of you, if you would, to tackle that question from a different point of view. Um, Philippe, let me stay with you on that, if I may. I'd love to hear about why, you know, what the real world challenge, challenges that are being solved and why this matters from a financial services industry point of view. And then we're going to come on to society, regulatory and geopolitical as well. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting if I look at our industry, modestly, I tend to see that we are industry within the banking world. So in that respect, uh, if I take DLT digital assets, is bringing 
on the long term a lot of uh, potential value. First of all, around trusted shared of data. I think as we, we know, it will accelerate the ability to share data, removing a lot of reconciliation and creating immutable uh, data layer. The second thing is if you look at the tokenization, it will be fast 24 seven, low cost, and it will increase liquidity as uh, illustrated by Mark a bit earlier. And let's say smart access in uh, general terms will as well reduce cost down the road, even if as a first step, one of the biggest challenges that we have is usually, usually to put the business case together because you have to bring innovation alongside your legacy infrastructure. So it creates a, a short-term barrier in putting meaningful business case together to push forward the uh, innovation. So that's one of the pain points uh, we are sometimes facing. Mm -hmm. And we're going to come on to some of the, the, the risks, the lags, the obstacles mm -hmm. a little bit later on in the conversation. So uh, it is, it's, uh, there are some really clear benefits for the, for the industry. Jennifer, I wonder if we could just bring it back to a societal point of view, you know, kind of why all of this investment, all of this innovation and all of this change really matters. Yeah, I think um, I'm going to go back to a few words I mentioned earlier, accessible, affordable, available. Uh, financial inclusion has really emerged as a critical societal issue because it creates opportunity. FinTech and the digitalization of our markets and the emergence of DeFi, as, as Mark referenced earlier, they have the potential to play a really important role in expanding financial inclusion by lowering barriers of entry, reducing costs, and bringing financial products and instruments to underserved areas. However, digital innovation has also created new and unexpected risks for the market and investors. So let's just consider a generation, for example, that has only known you know, an iPhone that is a mini computer in their hand or tablets or online gaming or you know, splitting their dinner tabs via modernized payment apps that are linked to their bank accounts, right? Digital wallets, treasure chests, coins, insert your, you know, your favorite big tech pay um, app, all of these things are native to how they transact, right? No cash, no cash, just cash alternatives. And so, you know, why does that really matter? Well, it does enable that greater accessibility and liquidity when you have technology solutions that are available at the click of a <laughs> click of a button, it changes the dynamic um, quite a bit. And so now because these assets are more available and accessible, they're seen as less effort, more convenient. People like that, right? In our personal life, it's hard not to adopt new apps or payment methods, et cetera. All you, all, it, all you have to do is have that willingness to learn, right? So now you've, you've taken away a lot of that barrier to entry. Who doesn't want that, right? Um, but is it better? I think that's where, you know, how, well, how much are you protected? Um, you know, where does responsible innovation come in? Is, it, is making your life simpler the only bar to hit? And in our industry, going back to even financial services, we spend a lot of time considering the value creation for any new product and service. What pain points are we solving for clients? In the case of digitalization of financial assets, um, an institutional investor can benefit from you know, built-in regulatory compliance, transparency, broader distribution of the assets, um, reduced costs, right? So it's important to understand that the evolution of assets is not new. It's been happening for a while and slow, and it's been slowly acclimating us to a more digital world, right? Uh, gaming tokens, airline points, all these things I mentioned earlier, you know, they're starting to set us up for, you know, um, very instantaneous access to things, right? And um, a new way of transacting. And all of this is underpinned then by a faith in technology, which mm -hmm. can raise concerns just as much as it can raise possibilities, right? Because once you're accustomed to transacting in a digital manner for goods and services, it's not a far leap to move into the investment space. And then it becomes really incumbent upon investors to develop a much more sophisticated understanding of where their risks actually lie. Well, I want to pick up, it's interesting, you finish on the word risk, but also I want to pick up on another word you mentioned earlier about protection as well. And think about that from a from, from another lens uh, around regulation, particularly. Mike, could I bring you in here? I would love to hear your thoughts about, you know, again, 
building on what's gone before, when we think about why the evolution of these assets matter, but from a regulatory point of view. Right. So I would argue, you know, that, so there are at least three important dimensions from a regulatory perspective, Julie. So one, you know, regulators need to examine these new assets and see, uh, you know, if they fit the definitions and constructs that are, you know, available today. Uh, you know, if I take a recent example, uh, uh, there, there's a lot of debate whether a particular product is a security, and, you know, in the SEC exchanges uh, recently, and should it be governed by security laws that we have on the books? So that's important. Um, and you don't want people to play regulatory arbitrage on related products by having two different sets of rules, right? Like, I mean, so that's, uh, that's an important consideration from a regulatory lens. And given the pace of innovation and, you know, the need to keep providing such clarity as new products continue to emerge, this is not uh, an, an easy thing to do. It's a challenge. And second, regulators also need to, you know, understand what new risks are being introduced, right? Like I mean, with these innovations and whether the existing laws and guidelines for investor protections and, you know, can provide safeguard against these risks. And that requires a big investment of time and a deeper level of understanding of the products, the technology, the actors, and the motivations. And so we can have the proper guardrails as well. And, and, and third, you know, you have to do all of what I just talked about um, while being mindful of, you know, fostering innovation uh, that will bring, you know, good outcomes. Uh, we're excited about these capabilities because they really are, you know, transformative, you know, for the number of reasons that we talked about. And if we don't get it right on a regulatory front, I mean, that can be a problem. So let's face it, it's a very competitive world. And if you have an overly restrictive set of rules in one region, others can take advantage of that, right? Like, I mean, and offer a more accommodating environment mm -hmm. to capture, you know, what can be the future growth engine. So it's a very tough balancing act, you know, like I'm mean, taking in all these diff different considerations. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be really fascinating seeing how the, the evolution of this works in terms of regulatory engagement and also appreciation and support versus the risk of regulatory arbitrage, which is which is really fascinating. And, and Mark, can I can I turn to you at this point? I'd love to you to think about this, if you would, from a, almost like a geopolitical. I'm going to give you the world, essentially, the geopolitical standpoint. I'll take it. Of, again, why all this matters. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't think there's a better example of how interesting this marketplace is in a geopolitical way than to look at the counterbalance between China and El Salvador. I mean, so just now over the past few weeks, we've heard China's cracking down again on cryptocurrencies. They're banning them once again. They're moving miners offshore. But at the same time, they're embracing the technology. They're embracing the concepts by launching a digital yuan. Um, and then by distributing it on a blockchain based or DLT based solution to through a lottery system um, to people to start to use it in, in real commerce. At the same time, you have a sovereign nation choosing to make Bitcoin a not just a currency, but legal tender. Uh, to pay taxes to be used in every merchant uh, available. I'm seeing pictures all over the place showing people in a McDonald's in El Salvador using uh, Bitcoin through a, through a payment app to be able to buy a Big Mac. And so that's the perfect uh, example of how this market has, has been going since it started uh, for the past decade, where you have spurts of innovation and movement forward. You have changes in direction from a, a geopolitical and regulatory standpoint once more information is understood. Um, some understand it more and embrace it. Some understand it more and are afraid of it and push it away. I think when you look at the United States, we're at a very interesting position because we have such mature regulations and our marketplaces are the most trusted in the world. So we have to be extremely careful in the way in which we approach these things because we can't damage that reputation of really being the place. If you want to have a safe haven to come invest, you come to the United States. So it has to be slow and methodical. And maybe people think there are mixed signals, but that's the way it has had to go, go because you also don't want to quash innovation. And I think when you think about that and you look at other areas in which can take advantage this is a team sport. This is a distributed systems. And so distributed systems require participation from a distributed group of participants. And it just happens to be a global group of participants. And the culture, the previous market structures, the trust in financial intermediaries versus the non-trust in financial intermediaries, all these things fall into play. And the products that are coming out 
really demonstrate a lot of the different areas in which you find trust and distrust and, rel and reliance and no reliability and existing marketplaces and green fields. And so all mm -hmm. of this has to work together to get to get to this common market infrastructure, whether you're building an economy around a token or whether you're trying to solve a major problem in collateral movement or mortgage servicing or settlement um, of, of cash based equities. All these things require massive participation from those who have different points of view, different cultural backgrounds, have to come together and work to make the technology optimized and drive to the value proposition of each of those use cases. So it's a really interesting time to watch something global, you know, being in foreign exchange for many, many years, you thought it was global, um, but this is truly global. Yeah, and it's going to be very interesting, I think, to see which of those emerging economies will take the lead and, and is everybody going to, to move at a similar pace or are we going to see some leaders and laggards and, and 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 also thinking through the trust actually the word i was coming to my mind just before you used it actually was this whole point about you know the, the trust in the system and the trust in the um in the evolution as well so i wanted i did allude to this earlier that we were going to tackle this also in terms of thinking about risks lags and obstacles as well and mike i wonder if i could come to you first of all i just want to ask you sort of a question about you know what we're at risk of overlooking and and what impact would these risks have on the evolving shape of developing assets Sure, I, and I think um, you know have you know the, the way we, you know when when we look at this space and uh, you know we talked about uh, how transformative they are. I think right now there's a disproportionate attention to the prices of these assets, the volatility, and maybe not enough examination of you know the really the true transformation, the new operating models, the new roles you know that would be emerging. And uh, I think that would be a disservice. I think uh, we really need to go deeper, and uh, you know, understand you know what you know how this future is going to emerge, and really you know take advantage of it, and really uh, and also prepare ourselves. I mean, to tackle that. So you know, I mentioned uh, you know you know BNY. I mean, we see these in, innovations um, with you know the far-reaching implications that we talked about. The analogy I use is uh, you know the same way. Internet was transformative in how we, you know, share information globally. You know, a couple of decades ago, um, these technologies are also equally powerful um, because you know not only they're touching payments and you know and you know remittances and capital market transactions, but you know they would also change in terms of the way we collaborate. They um, maybe how we use digital identity and. Um, you know, the applications of these, uh, you know, technologies is uh, really not, you know, it's, it's, it's far reaching. So we need to ask ourselves, you know, about the future. We need to ask about the roles that, you know, and the competencies needed. And this really has in a multifaceted, you know, aspect, uh, you know, including risk. Um, and some of the changes will be incremental and efficiency focused. I think those are easily, you know, noticeable because, uh, uh, you know, it's just, imagining the kind of the current kind of struct that we have it can be let's say in the investment services world how we streamline a subscription redemption models of funds but others can lead to completely new business model to totally reimagined right like i mean we're talking about now fully automated governed decentralized services and these are not just ideas now then we're seeing them actually come to life um but we need to understand in terms of the implication of that uh, from you know labor laws to taxes to uh, you know the different policies I mean that need to be in place. So I think we need to look beyond the horizon and start to discuss and debate you know like uh, we're having now uh, the future, um, and so we you know we can uh, prepare ourselves for it properly. And, and there you were talking uh, about kind of thinking, really thinking about kind of what are the competencies. So what are the use cases, but also where are the competencies as well? And and I and I. You know, as, as well, we know, Philippe, you were referring earlier about, you know, the fact that you need to run run the bank and change the bank kind of the same, at the same time. And, and there's obviously the role of vendors and collaborators and collaboration, of course, is one of our favourite words at Cybos. Um, I love your thoughts on, you know, what, where do you see the role of vendors and collaborators and where do you see some of those perhaps risks emerging? I think... First of all, as I said a bit earlier, very important, we are creating new ecosystems. So if I mm -hmm. take the banking world, we do not pretend that we will build the infrastructure on our own. 
So we need to, to bring together all those parties that I described a bit earlier, and it will be uh, the, the path for success. Uh, so, of course, it implies a lot of cultural change within the organization to uh, maybe open up a bit as well the banking industry to collaborate a bit further. But as you know, the banking industry like as well to have a clear playbook. And we see as we speak through discussion with regulators, with infrastructure such as DTCC, but I know very well the one in Asia like A6, HKX, where we have worked a lot on DLT topics a few years back already. I think we need to as well align the pace. And Mike was referring to, to, to that. The pace of innovation will depend, first of all, on the timing to put the playbook together, to put a bit of global standards as well. And I, mm -hmm. I, I like to take the recent analogy, I think on ESG topic, probably Europe has been a bit smarter to bring together the first regulation around SFDR much quicker than any of the past regulation in the financial industry. So I hope to foster accelerated innovation, our regulators will help and politicians to steer a playbook for us to execute a bit uh, quicker this innovation path. Because I mean, as expressed by Mark, by Jen, by Mike, we are all excited to be embarked even further in this transformation path, but we, we, we need to align this ecosystem and all the players that I described. And cultural change is definitely uh, an important topic because it's communicating with the external world. And as Mark was saying, it's a global reach as well. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing. You go to Shanghai, uh, Jen was referring to, uh, cash is useless in Shanghai today. So uh, this is reality. So uh, again, we need to be uh, careful when we have uh, looked at, I was referring to rec recent decision of Chinese uh, government. I think don't get it wrong. They will continue to foster innovation. They just need to control the pace of this innovation. Mm -hmm. That's what the decision uh, was about. But the direction is set. We are all going uh, towards uh, putting all this new uh, technology uh, together for the benefits uh, that we we discussed mm -hmm. and and mark well let me bring you in here because because what benoit uh sorry forgive me, philippe is, is saying there is that you know that the path is set the progress is clear the appetite for progress is very clear but but from your point of view i mean you've been in this industry a long time is where do you see the obstacles to actually achieve that reality so you know, Philippe is certainly correct, and, and I think pace is, is an important thing to think about. And for I think for all of us on, on this particular panel, the problem we have is, is that our pace involves entrenched business interests. It involves already existing things that are occurring. We don't have the ability to keep the breakneck pace of an innovator who starts with a blank piece of paper and says, I can do whatever I want, and this is what I'm going to do right now. And that innovation may turn out to be something that all of us have to react to and change our pace uh, in which we operate. And I think that that's where risk starts to come in is how much can you throttle up? And, and, and I think we all agree that the one risk you can't take is do nothing. That's the biggest risk of all right now. And so everyone needs to do something. And then the question becomes, what is it that we do? And if you don't have a clear leadership path and a culture of innovation, it's very difficult to just turn that on and make good decisions and stay focused on what's going to be right for you. And so when you think about banks just getting ready to custody something like Bitcoin, getting their heads around, how are we going to do that? What are the systems? The next thing you know, DeFi pops up and wait a minute now, how, how, and the discussion of maybe that's going to become institutional. And before you can even start to think about how that works, NFTs start, start going, right? So, <laughs> so but you can't chase them all. So you, it really requires discipline and, and a disciplined approach to these things in order to be successful. And it requires partnerships across the board. Um, at, at one of my other companies, Lob Trading, we love the term coopetition. Um, so, so you have to cooperate with your competitors in order for markets to move forward appropriately. And there's nothing more uh, that resonates competition than 
a, dig, a, a distributed ledger solution or a blockchain-based solution. It requires those market participants, all of them, to do the, perform their roles in a way in which make these networks work and work for the better for existing and markets that are maturing. Um, and the new markets that are happening today, that co that that coopetition and really uh, um, ability to organically get together online and create these these interesting innovation little uh, groups and then grow something where you don't even know the person's name. You just know some handle mm -hmm. online. Uh, this person goes by X handle and we just you know created a new smart contract that's gonna be a whole new financial product. Meanwhile, institutions that have existing businesses that are operating today and have clients that need to be serviced for their traditional businesses then have to find ways to partner hopefully with vendors but other financial institutions to be able to drive solutions side by side and scaffold these things up next to existing businesses so none of this is easy uh but it's extremely mm -hmm. exciting and it's worth the investment so um i think we're going to see the risk of, of not doing something be the biggest risk uh, and the ability for groups to work together in new ways and collaborate in new ways to, to drive this technology forward over the next decade. And, and Jennifer, you were nodding along quite a lot with what Mark was saying there, I, I noticed as well. I mean, for, I, I'd love you to sort of uh, tackle the question, if you would, from a from an infrastructure point of view. Exactly as Mark says, we don't, not everybody has the luxury of a blank piece of paper and there is some <laughs> fundamental infrastructure underlying it. So love your thoughts about you know, where do you see uh the p infrastructure changing and you know where do you see perhaps it's not changing fast enough and where, where are we seeing trends emerge perhaps even geographically yes i you know i i really do appreciate mark's comments because um part of my team's responsibility is to just you know look look outside and think about you know how we can do things differently and that means starting from a blank sheet of paper sometimes and um, but when you when you have to bring it home, right? You look at DTCC and you look at the you know the vast breadth of assets that we that we process today, and it's an it's a fairly overwhelming um, task then to think about how you bring innovation together with you know your classic organization, for example. Um, but I, what you know what I've what I've seen a lot from infrastructure, and I'm. And I, I think it's a it's a great sign, even on a, especially on a global basis, when you see firms like DTCC, like SDX, like Hong Kong Exchange, um, you see newer startups like you know HQLAX and and others. You you see what BNP and what what Bank of New York are doing internally within their organizations to support digital assets, right? None of these organizations are are standing still, right? No one wants to be left behind. We all want to you know, have a role in that future. And so what I think the, the one of the more important things for market infrastructure is to think about what their future business model is gonna look like. And I, I recognize that that has some, that that has some negative, um, you know, reaction sometimes from a DeFi community, right? But look, as, as, as more asset classes evolve in a digitalized form, right, all of our roles are going to shift, right? And so even at DTCC, we see opportunities where we might shift from a cash versus securities clearing and settlement, um, you know, world to one that is more agnostic on asset transfers, for example, right? Those are things we think about and consider. Um, but all Ultimately, right, new roles for regulated financial market infrastructures um, could emerge, right? We have opportunities to apply time-tested, regulated governance models to these new networks, if you will. And I think, you know, I think, you know, we've heard already in this section that with regards to new technology, right, it does require time, coordination, and an incremental approach, particularly when you think about the breadth of assets that already exist, right? And so mm -hmm. as we look to adopt some of these, you know, digital assets and their different forms and, and distributed ledger technology and those networks, you know, we can't do that in a single step, right? Our industry, um, you know, has requirements. We have a responsibility um, to ensure that we are not introducing new risk into the system. So it will take some time and coordination. And there, but there's ways that you can still do that, right? You could still start to see how that evolves through, you know, broader use of APIs, right, to create function um, optionality, or how you can bring legacy and the more innovative digital assets together in a single portfolio. Um, maybe it's not mm -hmm. even just digital securities. Maybe, you know, 
there are certain organizations that are already starting to look at how you bring together NFTs and cryptocurrencies and, you know, and and digital securities, for example, together in wallets. So I, I feel like there's there's a lot of amazing ways that you, we can move this stuff forward, but we just can't we can't just expect that it's going to happen overnight, right? There, there is existing infrastructure, as Mark mentioned, um, and you know it's important for us to be thinking about how we create found foundational steps to support that. And I think there are there are ways to do that beyond just ripping out existing infrastructure and putting something new in. Um, as Mark mentioned, you have you know, hold ons and looking for white spaces where you can introduce the technology to build you know, to operationalize it and gain um, confidence in it and adoption around it, et cetera, and then start to think about how it connects to some of the more legacy infrastructures. I think all of that starts to play a role. And the last thing I'll mention is, I think we've heard this already, but this takes us to a much more global market, right? And ultimately, you know, today we have, you know, regulation that requires us to, you know, have certain infrastructures in different um, regions and, and apply, you know, different regulatory requirements, et cetera. You know, we have to think about, you know, what point in time, you know, does it make sense to have more global opportunities um, versus regional ones. So I think it's all going to be a very interesting, uh, interesting um, topics to discuss in the coming in the coming years, months, etc. Absolutely. And what you've done so very beautifully is you've kind of pushed the conversation on into uh, kind of what the future may look like there in terms of how some of these are going to converge and, and come together and, and kind of even create sort of new models as well. Mark, I'd love to come back to you and then I'm going to bring in Philippe after that, because I'd love to get when you think about sort of new generations of assets and as they evolve. You now, what do you think we can anticipate? And, and I'm also keen to understand any changes you're putting in place in anticipation of what might be coming. So I, did you say Mark or Mike? Because I just want to make sure. Uh, Mark. Yes, I thought so. Um, so I, look, I, I think one of the things that, that we've sort of had a mantra around for almost day one has been that these instruments need to be native to these ledgers, not tokenization, right? Tokenization is when you, you actually have the real instrument somewhere else and you synchronize it to a ledger. A ledger becomes secondary to the actual instrument itself. So that requires maintaining all your existing systems and adding an additional layer on top. That's what this technology uh, is definitely not about. Um, when you go to digitally native, where it, it is originated natively to a blockchain, where it is it is held through its full life cycle there um, as the true representation of an instrument, then all the possibilities start to um, open up for how this technology can be used, how you can use automation through smart contracts, how you can integrate into external systems that then drive the instrument on ledger rather than the opposite so that everyone shares this golden record, but also that that particular instrument can, can act autonomously. So you can reinvent a lot of existing instruments that we have today and create new issuances so that they exist solely as a digital instrument and there's no legacy technology there's no legacy paper trail there's no legacy at all it becomes a new a new type of instrument and that is extremely powerful and it changes the paradigm on how all these things can work can you imagine an, an, a cash-based equity that is digitally native in which you know the ultimate beneficial owner and in real time the company who issued those shares knows the ultimate beneficial owner and then they can add incentives to for their product to those users. Can you imagine that you can say, oh, you're, in a, you're a shareholder and a user of my product, so now I'm gonna give you an extra, extra incentive on the product for your brand loyalty. These things mm -hmm. could never exist in the current paradigm. So it's endless of what the blank piece of paper is once these become native, um, but while we're still restricted by existing systems and, and the way in which those instruments are currently being represented through digitization, we're gonna be hamstrung on innovation and in the way these things can evolve. Uh, really, really interesting. And, and Philippe, I'm keen to bring you in here as quickly as we can, if you would, because there is an element here of um, leadership. Let, let's have let's have a leadership conversation. And I think particularly about as we look to the future, the next generation of leadership. I would love your thoughts. And what do you think they will be thinking about when it comes to the future of digital assets? Uh, first of all, uh, in the segue to, to the uh, in the past to the answer, I would say what I feel very interesting in the transformation that we are facing in all our organization is 
the line between historical IT or tech guys and business is now totally blurred. And I think part mm -hmm. of the innovation and the transformation is uh, towards this, uh, the, the, the vanishing of this gap between those uh, people within the same organization. And I think uh, looking at the way Mark was uh, designing it, you need to reconcile a bit of technology, business case, uh, extra, and put all this together. So there is a massive cultural change to operate in all organization, because ultimately, as I said, partnership being the ultimate goal, you need then to put yourself in a position to interact with other stakeholders. So I think this is a, a very important, uh, uh, let's say, a path that we have to take collectively to make this innovation successful. After, I would say, <coughs> interesting to, uh, to note that on top of the cultural uh, challenge, I think we need to uh, recognize as well, it was said that we need to focus on priorities. We have tackled around this panel a lot of topics and none of us have the bandwidth to tackle all of them together. So I think we need to steer as well, realistically, some discipline, because I can tell you every morning, my teams are coming with plenty of new ideas, of proof, proof of concept with clients, with uh, infrastructure, etc. So you need to uh, filter this and to stick to a certain discipline. Otherwise, I think the pace that we'll all expect to accelerate will go nowhere. So I think uh, this is as well a very challenging uh, aspect of our job uh, steering the innovation absolutely and, and i think that the because you would get completely swallowed up in in the many 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 different use cases and and mike can i can i hear your thoughts as well you know as as industry leaders as we all come together and as we all collaborate uh, around the future is where do you think we should be putting our money where our mouth is you know where should we be investing to address the and shape indeed the future of assets Sure thing. I would I would offer up three things, uh, three areas, Julie. So I think one, we really need to invest in education. Uh, you know, we we you know we need deeper understanding and the clarity in the space is is important. Uh, we should not underestimate you know how different this de you know decentralized construct that we talk about, the new language that we have in the space, and how it operates. And it's going to take time you know, before it is intuitive. Um, you know, this includes, you know, the ta taxonomy, for instance, you know, Mark was talking about tokenization, uh, you know, tokenization, for instance, you know, how, you know, uh, you know, I was using it includes native issuances of, of these things as well. So we need to bring in and, you know, harmonize in terms of, you know, like, I mean, how, uh, how we understand the space. Um, our clients, you know, employees, shareholders, you know, the public in general would, you know, everyone will benefit from a uh, greater understanding of this innovation, how is it going to impact and transform our lives, and what are the ways that people can participate. So I think, you know, investing in education, really just making sure to demystify these capabilities is important. Um, second, I would say we need to invest on infrastructure. Infrastructure, not just bolting on things to what we have. Of course, we need to live with existing infrastructure and how we're going to make work with the new systems. But we really need to reimagine as well and say, you know, uh, take a more collaborative and expansive view um, in how we build how the rails for the future. And, and when we do that, we need to really tap into the best from you know, the startups, the large organizations, research institutions, you know, across the board. Um, you know, if I take an example at BNY, you know, as a firm, we, we, um, we you know, we believe we can't build this thing alone. And um, we leverage, you know, the best in class. If I give you an example, we, uh, in our multi-asset class uh, custody solution, um, we have our understanding uh, of our client needs, the risk, the regulatory uh, expectations uh, and compliance and everything else that goes with it. And at the same time, bringing in a laser focused technology firm that actually built an you know, uh, innovative solution and see how we can um, you know, build around that and you know, uh, offer a compelling solution. So that collaboration is important. 
And the last one I would mention is, uh, you know, uh, we need to invest time and resources in public engagement and policies because, uh, you know, for us to really get this space right, we need to have, you know, robust debates and discussions and really put the right environment and guardrails, um, uh, you know, uh, to uh, help us actually get the most out of the space as well. So those would be the areas that, you know, I think we need to invest seriously. Mm -hmm. And then when you when you sort of frame that out so so clear about education and also infrastructure and and public policy engagement as well, I can't help but think of some of the conversation earlier about you know, the different appetites and paces of change around the world as well. And Jennifer, I just wonder if I could just hear your fast thoughts just on in terms of where you see the future and where you're investing. Yeah, so I think you know, again again I'm going to go back to um, something that you know we heard. Um, earlier, which is priorities, right? Not all clients have the same tech capabilities. So you got to be careful about introducing a situation where a client could be disadvantaged by a new solution you're bringing to market. So I think you're know, ensuring we spend a lot of time talking with our stakeholders and our and um, our clients and, and other third parties around new and innovative solutions so that we can just ensure that we we have the right approach for moving something forward, that we're bringing the industry along versus versus trying to force fit something. Um, you know, we're in a situation as well where talent and, and skill sets become incredibly important, right? So ensuring that we have the right talent and skills to support um, market, you know, market infrastructure and solutions that we want to offer in this type of technology space, right? I think that's really critical. You can't you can't um, expect a large um, FMI to introduce a new solution without having that in place. So that's also a really important part for us to spend time upskilling and reskilling and, and hiring um, the right talent and uh, right talent um, to help us move move some of this stuff forward. And then I think you know again we go back to focusing on areas that are white space or or areas that not necessarily bolt on to add technology to technology, but that actually solve real problems for clients, um, but using technology in a much more effective manner. And so I think, you know, the more that we can focus on those areas, we can help, you know, bring some of these opportunities to to um, launch and and then, you know, drive adoption um, through through that. So I think, you know, a lot of exciting things for us in the future, um, but I, I feel like those are probably some of the most important things to think about. I have to say, it's been an incredibly rich conversation. You know, we think about the different perspectives and dynamics that are all at play, the different paces, the considerations as well. I, I'd like to ask you a final question each, actually, because as you say, it's a very, very timely discussion, but it's not one that's going away. But also, you know, we've been thinking very much about the pace of change, the appetite for change, and what is an appropriate pace of change. Making predictions five years out in this game is is not always the best time horizon because because things do change in such a dynamic market. So I wondered if I could ask you to just look ahead, say three years, and and really my question centres around what do you believe will be obsolete in three years from now? And I wondered, Mike, if I could come to you first of all, what's going to be obsolete in three years time? Three years time. Uh, sure. This. Um... Look, I mean, the potential is there to fully automate, you know, parts of the investment services. And we touched on it with smart contracts earlier today. But uh, I don't know, this may disappoint you, but I think I wouldn't go as far as saying anything would be going obsolete in three years. Uh, just because, you know, just change takes time. But maybe the question, you know, whether digital assets are here to stay uh, or they're in fact, I think that hopefully that would be obsolete, but uh, not in the not not in the market infrastructure space. <laughs> Love it. The questions become immediately obsolete. <laughs> That's fantastic. Mark, can I ask you the same, the same question if you would? <laughs> so we've only got three and a half minutes left and you know we've agreed a lot today. So I, I'd love to say something that would uh, create a lot of disagreement. So I'm gonna give it a shot. Mm -hmm. So I think something like transfer agency uh, will be obsolete in the next three years. I don't think the regulations are going away because we all know regulations never go away uh, until there's some sunset rules, right? Um, but we're all about enabling and empowering and not, not disrupting and disintermediating. So you can enable and empower uh, entities to do things in a different way. So I think you can completely automate out the transfer agent function today if we had the will. So it's not a question of what's going to go away. I think it's more, what do we have the will to get rid of? What do we have the will to say, okay, enough's enough, there's a better way, let's just do it. 
Um, and I think that's a great example. Look at, if you don't know what a transfer agent does, look at what they're supposed to do and think about how a smart contract can do all that better, faster, cheaper, and let's move on. Well, let's, let's see. Let's see. We'll keep an eye on that for sure. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. Jennifer, similar question to you. What do you think will be obsolete? Yeah, I'm actually, um, I'm really glad you brought that up, Mark, because um, I actually was going to say some friction, right? Ultimately, I think, um, you know, when we look at innovation today, you know, we try really hard to make sure everyone still has a role, but I think it's incumbent upon each individual firm to figure out how and what their new business model is going to look like in a new paradigm, right? So my hope is that there is some friction that's obsolete, I, but I, at the same time, I happen to tend to agree with Mike that I think that's probably um, too optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Philippe, your, your final thoughts on that, as you look at the world, where, where do you see the potential for obsolescence? No, I, actually, I don't, I, I'm not pessimistic in any means, but I don't see uh, much obsolescence in three years horizon. However, I would love to be wrong and I would love to see TA being transformed at the pace Mark is wishing to. Uh, and I'm, I'm very keen to bet and to be wrong on that one and to have a drink in three years time at the next IBOS around the same topic. Uh, but I'm very excited, looking forward and the opportunity to create for all the indus financial industry I mean, including infrastructure, because I, I strongly believe we have a, we have an exciting path uh, working differently than today, leveraging all these technologies. Philippe, well, I, have to say... that... I was going to say, Philippe, you'd probably win that bet because eight years ago when I founded this company, I said in five years, we will be operating in a decentralized solution and multiple use cases with multiple financial institutions. And eight years <laughs> later, we're still we're still trying to get that accomplished. So uh, so hopefully in three years, we can have a little different story. Well, keep keep so your energy say, and, and stay disruptive. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, it's been a fantastic conversation. If, if you just think about it, in a really short period of time, we've not only level set our understanding, I've also pushed our thinking about, you know, what does this in, encompass? We thought about some of the definitions, we thought about the um, the real use cases and why this conversation about the future of assets really matters. We thought about the risks, the obstacles and the lags in the system. And we've also thought about what the future may hold, whether or not elements of it will be obsolete. It's been a fantastic conversation. So Mike Demacy, Mark Smith, Jennifer Peavy and Philippe Benoit, thank you so much. I've been Julia Streets to everybody. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Thank you.